Hey YouTubers, it's Charlie. I hope you've all had a chance to see the first episode of Star Wars Rebels. This video is going to be my top 10 moments. Disney was real nice and made the episode available early on Disney XD in the website last week. I already did a review of that, so I'll link it in the description, but I didn't include any spoilers in that, so this video is just going to dig into specific moments. And in case you were wondering, yes, I will be doing weekly videos for all the episodes. I'll probably try and include some movie stuff in those videos too, just because I'll be doing Star Wars stuff already. But careful for spoilers from episode one if you haven't seen it yet. Everybody ready? Here we go. Number 10, Star Destroyer intro. Thematically, I feel like it's a requirement that every new Star Wars project begin with an overhead Star Destroyer shot. It's just an unspoken rule. It tells you everything you need to know instantly. The Empire is a looming presence. Guaranteed, this is going to be the opening shot of the Episode 7 movie too. Even in the Expanded Universe, during the Rise of the New Republic, the Empire is still very much a threat. The other really awesome thing about this intro, it is quick and to the point. No foreplay. No 5 minute crawl scene. I totally love the title crawl, but if you remember the Family Guy at Star Wars episodes, it is ripe for parody just because it is too long, didn't read. Like television is not made for that kind of stuff. They'll totally put it in episode 7 though, it's much more of a movie thing. Number 9, the planet Lothal and the Outer Rim locations. I'm kinda glad that they didn't start on Tatooine. That has been done enough. It's a big galaxy, let's see some of it. While Ezra is kind of a stand-in for young Luke Skywalker, he's not that character, so they're trying to differentiate him. Putting it in a different part of the galaxy just helps do that. But yes, we are thinking the same thing. You know, young Luke Skywalker meets a version of Obi-Wan, gets swept up in intergalactic adventure. There are only so many versions of the hero's journey tale you can tell, which is why I can't wait for the Boba Fett movie to come. That will be a very different spin on a Star Wars story. And yes, they are working on a Boba Fett movie. Just in terms of locations, Rebels is going to take place mostly in the Outer Rim. There will be a little overlap with planets we saw in Clone Wars, like the Kessel Spice Mines. I mean, there are a lot of planets in the Star Wars universe. Most of them have been visited at one point or another. I don't have an exact list of all the planets we're going to visit. That's not really information they disseminate. If you're a big fan of the comics too, remember Marvel just took back the Star Wars comics. They're going to be visiting some new places in those titles. Number 8, the sound design. The Star Wars universe has very specific sounds that just distinguish it from other science fiction. Actually most other sci-fi, not including anime, steals a lot from Star Wars, especially when it comes to sounds. I guess you could say a lot of other things are inspired by Star Wars. It's kind of hard to get around, I mean it's been so popular for such a long time. But you immediately notice all the little things. Different types of engine sounds, different blaster sounds, doors opening and closing, it just instantly makes you feel at home. Like it's very familiar in a comfortable way. In fact, a lot of the big action sequences were sound mapped to sync up with the beats in the original trilogy and the scenes that inspired them, like the speeder bike chase or the catwalk scene from Empire Strikes Back. It reminds you just how important the technical people in the production are. There's like an army of sound editors and engineers that pick through thousands and thousands of sound effects and go in after all the voice work is done and the score is composed and just touch things up with very Star Wars specific things. The score too is amazing, it's just a modified version of the classic John Williams score. I feel like that's another unwritten law of Star Wars productions. Anytime you make a new series, you have to incorporate the classic Williams score somehow. Number 7, Team Ghost rolls out in Central City. You can see from the non-verbal way they pull their high stop that they've been doing this together for a long time. They're a strong team, so the wild card is always going to be Ezra. The heist itself doesn't really go down as planned, but I always love meeting teams after they've come together like experienced teams. It's a lot of fun to watch a bunch of strangers get thrown together and try to figure things out, but when you do a story that way, you end up having to hijack a lot of your stories with exposition to show them evolving as a group. Where we are in Rebels right now, the crew of the Ghost is already at their peak, so now they can just have more fun telling mischief-managed stories. It's like the more experience you have, the better trouble you can find. Number 6, The Ghost Ship. Yes, it is inspired by the Millennium Falcon. Technically, it's just a different, smaller model of Corellian light freighter. They haven't revealed whether it's been modified as extensively as the Falcon, but I assume so. They also use it for smuggling, so it's probably been modified. I totally love how the Corellian freighter design over the years has become synonymous with galactic piracy and lovable scoundrels. This is just the first episode, so we will see more of the ship in the future, but just looking at the state of things gives you a good picture for how well the crew's doing. The computer animation does a good job of making everything feel dirty. One of the few things that I didn't like quite as much about Clone Wars was that all the surfaces just looked brand new. 
I understand why they did things that way. Like it was done on purpose. Like computer animation is very intensive work. So if you see something in a frame, it's because it was supposed to be there. But I just love the dirty lived in look that Rebels has right now. It looks like they make just enough to get by, but they're not rolling in credits or anything. It just gives the series a much greater sense of urgency when your characters are always searching for the next meal. Number five, Obi-Wan Kenobi cameo. He's not a main character on the show, but the holocron is an amazing device for future cameos. In terms of Clone Wars people, they have said Ahsoka and most of the other characters are still canon, so there is potential for them to pop up, but mostly we're going to be focusing on the new people we met in this episode. Number four, Wookiee Rescue on Kessel. It was a nice callback to the original series and the Clone Wars. I know some of you are wondering who that young Wookiee was supposed to be. It was not Chewbacca. Like in the canon, Chewbacca is close to 200 years old at the beginning of the original trilogy. And as far as I know, they have not changed that. I know they messed with some of the canon, but Chewbacca is still really, really old. I'm kind of hoping that situations like this, where the ghost goes and saves groups of people, gets paid off later. Like the Wookiees or some other group ends up helping them out of a jam later in the series. I don't think they were trying to set up any specific characters with these Wookiees, but hopefully we'll see a lot more Wookiees on the series. I'm a big fan of the race. Number three, Agent Callus. One of my favorite new Star Wars villains and definitely one of the smarter ones. There's this tendency to make villains on children's shows too silly, like too easy to defeat. It's done so that children can always understand that the heroes will win, that good will win over evil. Rebels is a children's show, but that does not mean that the crew of the ghost always has to win. You can still do a version of the downer ending like Empire Strikes Back and have it be a fun show with a positive message. The Ezra prison block scene is a good example of that. He gets left behind so the stakes go up and when he's rescued it's a much more satisfying payoff. And it lets you know that Callus is not completely incompetent as an Imperial officer. He and the main villain, the Inquisitor, have like this Watson-Sherlock relationship, only it's really twisted because they're evil characters. Number two, the Empire Strikes Back catwalk save. The big payoff was Kanan rolling up on top of the ghost. Very Lando Calrissian of him. It would have been a little bit funny, but I am glad they didn't go for any obvious I am your father references. Like that would have been a little too much. Like they're trying to pay homage to the original trilogy. They're not trying to copy it. I did love that they let Callus kick that stormtrooper off at the end. And my number one moment, meet the Inquisitor. Another great original trilogy nod to Vader's holocom with the Emperor in Empire Strikes Back. We'll actually meet the Inquisitor in person in the next couple of episodes. And some of the clips they've been posting online of him fighting Kanan are from much later in the season. I think this one is from episode 6. The character is being voiced by Lucius Malfoy, which is totally appropriate. Dave Filoni described the character as being like an evil Sherlock Holmes. When he said that, I was a little confused. I wondered why he didn't just say Moriarty, but I suppose that Moriarty and Sherlock aren't really perfect copies of each other. Like Moriarty revels in chaos. So I think that by calling the Inquisitor an evil Sherlock, Filoni just means that he's a genius detective that loves solving cases. Like he's not out to burn down the galaxy or mass murder civilians. Darth Vader gave him a case and he's solving it one Jedi at a time. We can talk more about him whenever he actually shows up in an episode for real. And like I said, he and his assistant, Agent Callus, have this fun Sherlock Watson relationship. So it's going to be really exciting. Let me know though, what was your favorite moment from the premiere and which Clone Wars characters do you really want them to bring on? I know everyone really wants Ahsoka, but there are a whole bunch of other people that they could do. Just as a bonus, I guess I didn't mention it in this video, but I talked about it in my review. There was that speech at the end, the Kanan Obi-Wan Kenobi speech. Like they basically gave him Obi-Wan Kenobi's speech from episode six. I just, I didn't want to repeat myself because I talked about it a lot in my review video. My next Rebels video is going to be another bonus video. They're basically airing the premiere again, I think, on October 13th. That's a Monday. It's going to be a Monday show, but be sure to subscribe to get everything. If there's anything specific to Rebels that you want to talk about or Star Wars related, just let me know and I'll try to include it on my bonus video list. Right now, click here for my review of the episode and click here for my Korra video from today. Who else is happy that that show just came back? Thank you so much for watching. So let's all high five and get ready. Doctor Who tomorrow. See you guys.